Worship Center. Who's ready to worship Jesus tonight? For those of you joining us online, welcome to our service this evening. Father, we thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy that has brought us safely, Lord, into this place. Lord, we're gathered here for one reason only, Lord, and that is to give you the praise that you rightfully deserve. God, you're worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing this together. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. through generations
praise Him in this place. We serve a faithful God, amen. Amen. He deserves better than that. Our, our God is faithful. Amen. Come on, somebody give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, give your neighbor a high five to the right, to the left. For those of you just joining us online, welcome to our service this evening. But as you're taking your seat, let's turn our attention to the screen and see what's going on on Connect. Amen. Welcome to CWC Bay Area. I'm Rob Chan, and you're watching Connect.
Thank you for making CWC Bay Area your home for worship. We look forward to serving alongside you today. Join us for our annual Passion Parade, which will be held Friday, March 29th at 10 a.m. We'll be meeting up at the Chick-fil-A parking lot here in Milpitas on Calabaras Boulevard. Following the Passion Parade, we'll be having our Good Friday service here on campus beginning at 12 p.m. We invite you to come and experience a powerful moment as we go over the last seven words of Jesus on the cross and having a time of communion together. Hey there, are you ready for an amazing event? Join us March 29th from 12 to 2 p.m. at Gill Park in Milpitas for a free event hosted by CWC Bay Area. Over 5,000 eggs can be filled with... Wait. <laughs> we start there. Over 15,000 candy-filled eggs will be will go along with food trucks, jump houses, and more. This event is completely free. To save time, pre-registration is now open. See you there. Finally, our Easter Sunday service will center around the theme of forgiving and will be held on March 31st with our regular service times at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. CWC, remember, it's the personal invitations that makes the greatest impact. So we're asking each of you to reach out to family and friends you've been praying for and get them here for the service. Bay Area Leadership Academy has begun two new courses. These classes are being held on Tuesday via Zoom. Our first class is on Spirit of Leadership led by Senior Pastor Dan Vera from 6 to 7 p.m. The second class will be on Theology 2 led by Pastor Steven from 7.15 to 8.15 p.m. To register or for more information on these courses, we ask that you please see Pastor Catalina or Reverend Jessica following the service. That's it for now. I'm Rob Chan and you're watching Connect. Welcome everybody. Welcome to midweek service tonight. We'd like to give yourself a hand and applause for making out on a Wednesday night. If you're here, just know that you're not here by accident, huh? Praise the Lord. Someone's prayed for you. Someone's got you here. Even God himself may have urged you to get here. But welcome. Welcome online. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Let us know where you're watching from. We always appreciate that. Uh, before I get started tonight, um, tonight my scripture will be... Uh, Oh, and let me back up first. Let me welcome all our first-time comers, first visitors. If you're here in the house, just raise your hand. If you're, and we'll get an usher to you. If you're online, send us a wave emoji and let us know where you're watching from. We always appreciate that. Um, also, we'd love to connect with you. Stand with me as we get ready to worship uh, with our tithe and offering. But before, like I was getting ready to say... It takes faith to be here tonight, right? It takes faith to come out and, and serve the Lord, first of all, right? It takes faith to just to, just to believe in God, to, to make it through the week. We're here today expecting through faith. So today I'd like to say to Brother Daniel Martinez that we're praying for you. Keep your head up. Just know that through faith we're praying for you. For our brother Dave Gomez and your family, we're also praying for you. And for everyone that's put in a prayer request on Tuesday mornings, we're praying for you. And if you're online and you have a prayer request and need prayer, feel free to just text us. And the pastoral staff will make sure that we pray for you. We'll reach out to you. I'd like to thank our online givers tonight, your mailing givers. And thank you for being faithful. Jonathan Jaime and Jeff and uh, Sana Kuna. 
Thank you very much for your faithful and giving tonight. Tonight's word of God, inspired word of God, is from Hebrews 6.11. Our great desire is that you will keep loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. To keep loving others, that right there is, that's, that's a tough one in itself, right? I mean, <laughs> anger kids, I mean, just, it's just tough, right? So it's, it's, let's just be real. Sometimes it's, it's very difficult to continue to love your brother. I mean, you love him, but it's, it's hard. <laughs> but it can be done, right? Because we, we know it can be done. So, for, so, so your hope will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull. Follow the example of those who are, go, who are going because of their faith and endurance. Some healing is quick and some takes time, but it all takes faith. Amen? Amen. True faith is seeing the victory before it even happens. True faith is before the blessing is manifested is that we're believing in it. And patience is waiting for that faith, knowing in God's timing that whatever it is that we're hoping for or praying for, whether it's a loved one or whether it's someone sick like my brother Daniel and, and and just people that are out there, right, that, that are going through things, keep the faith, brother. We're praying for you as a body, as, as a unity, and whatever else you're going through out here tonight. I, I, I don't know, but just lift it up and keep faith. It, it may happen right away, but keep endurance. Just keep, keep to the grind, right? Keep, keep to the grind. You won't see the miracle unless we, we keep hanging in there. So if you get ready to do your tithe and offer with me, um, let me get my wallet out. All right, I think I got it down this week. Uh, this is my tithe. With it, I give God my best. I activate my God covenant with my first fruits. I expect checks in the mail, refunds and rebates, promotions at work, healing in my body, bonuses and blessings. Blessings come with unto me now. And who knows, that's another act of faith. So tonight's theme for me is faith, right? Just we give because we're faithful, and God is faithful. He's always going to be faithful. You know, and I was also thinking about this is the week that uh, today is possibly the day that Jesus ratted on, I mean, Judas ratted on Jesus, right? So, you know, snitched him off, and it's always the ones that are closest to us that, that it hurts. It doesn't hurt if it comes from someone else. But while he's hanging on the cross, he said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's the kind of love and forgiveness that we need to give to each other, right? I mean, that's a perfect example. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we give tonight, we give to you through faith, my God. And we pray, Lord Father, that no matter what we're facing, what giant that, it, that is in front of us, that you're bigger than any giant that we'll face. And as we give to you, we pray that you bless those that give, bless that, those that are here in attendance, those that are online, Lord Father. As we lift you up this evening, we thank you for this week. And this, this coming faith Sunday that, that you made it all possible. In your precious name, amen. amen. Can you guys hear me all right? Can you guys hear me all right? Are we good on the mic? I want to thank you online, and I want to thank you in the house. Um, online campus, we appreciate the time that you've spent and went ahead and um, tuned in tonight. Uh, tonight is a completion of a great series. Come on, somebody. Was it a great series? It's a, it was an eight-part series. Amen. And God showed up all through the series. They were talking real talk in the series. It's called the Bend, Bend There series. And there was, um, today, I'm on the stage with Sister Victoria and Brother Henry. <laughs> Two powerhouses in the faith. You know, I had an opportunity to talk to them earlier, and you know what? They're already in their gift and calling without a title. And a lot of times, people are doing things that God has called them to do, 
even before a title comes or even before there's a stage. And most people's stage is in life in general. Amen. Amen. If you're a Christian, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. I call that ministry-minded. Ministry-minded. Amen. Amen. Pastor Dan, Sister An uh, Pastor Angie, want to thank you for this opportunity to be up here to share the stage. Amen. Get behind your pulpit. It's an honor and a privilege to have learned from you both, and you are two amazing people, and I, I so uh, value you, and I want to thank you for being in our lives, all of our lives. All of us are recipients of that great anointing you have on your life. Amen. 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 So moving, moving through this is called Ben there, moving past re rejection. And so our first question is, have you ever felt rejected? Brother Henry? Yeah, uh, I feel rejected every time I step on the scale. <laughs> I just play, I just play, I had to say that. Man, so I had to say something funny before I was gonna share what I wanna share. So when I thought about rejection, um, I remember that there were certain things growing up when my mom was busy, my dad wasn't around. And what would happen is that, you know, I would go to middle school, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cry, middle school, I would go to elementary, but my dad was never there. Or my mom was too busy. So at that moment, I was too young to understand that the responsibility as a parent is to take care of the child. And in that moment, I, I started to discover what, what, what rejection was, I felt, right? But as I grew up getting older, I started finding things to supplement that rejection. So it ran really deep, right? So the drugs and everything else was a byproduct of something that happened when I was smaller. Smaller, and, and, and I didn't understand that. So that was my first remembrance of rejection was when, wow. I, when I was in uh, kindergarten, it's crazy, back in the 80s, I was in kindergarten, I remember uh, Halloween, I was talking to my mom about this, Halloween, and then uh, how come I, even, I even had to call and ask her, hey, why don't you show up? She, oh, I had to work. But at the moment, that feeling came up again when I was started thinking about rejection and, 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 and how I felt. I can't remember everything, but I remember how I felt. Didn't have a costume. I didn't have a, I seen everybody else's parents there but my own, and, and that stuck out to me. So that, that's my experience. Wow. With Thank you, Brother Henry. Thank you. Sister Victoria. Um, so my experience that came to mind um, was my career. Um, I've been in the HVAC industry since I was, I think, 19, um, just in the office side. Um, and when I was establishing my career in the industry, there was a point in time where I was with a, a small mom and pop shop. And we had gotten bought out by a much bigger HVAC company. Um, and when we got bought out, I had worked my way up from being a secretary to a dispatcher to a sales coordinator. And the next step that I wanted to go towards was being an executive assistant within our branch. And um, I was, at the time, I was the only sales coordinator. Um, and I was, I think I was supporting about 10 salesmen and women plus the sales manager. And so, and I was the only one, and I thought I was totally safe. This is my career, I'm good. It turns out um, the business took a hit, the industry as a whole was just taking a hit. Um, and uh, the company had announced that they were gonna start doing rounds of layoffs. And this is a building with like 100 plus employees. And my mentality was I'm safe, I'm good, um, I got this. Turns out, I was in the first round of layoffs. Um, and I actually didn't find out until the day of. Uh, so I walked in through the doors. Everyone was happy-go-lucky, as usual. I sit at my desk. And the moment I sit at my desk, our branch manager calls me into his office and tells me that I'm in the first round of layoffs. I have to immediately go to my desk, pack my stuff, and leave. And that was just like not really a slap in the face because that's just how the industry is, especially in the slow times. Um, but it was more of like, oh my God, they don't want me, like rejection. And the girl who took my position was the executive assistant that was supposed to retire and things like that. So it was kind of like, oh my God, they really don't want me. Um, so that was one that really came to mind because after years of building your career and putting in all the blood, sweat, and tears, just to be let go in an instant, it was like, 
that's rejection. And that hit me hard. Wow. Thank you for your share, Sister Victoria. Yeah, um, rejection has long lasting impact. Um, I have a similar story as, as, as Henry. I grew up with a lot of cousins, with a lot of kids at our house, and um, with a lot of single, I had a lot of single aunts around me, and we all lived in one house, and um, it just seemed like I wasn't wanted at the house. That's how I felt. I never asked. Uh, I didn't really talk to anybody because I, you know, I was just a kid. I left Salinas when I was about nine. So I was already running, going to school and not coming home. Like they would be looking for me at my friend's house and I would tell my friend's parents that it was, uh, my, my mom said it was okay for me to spend the night. So just imagine I'm second grade, not coming home. Because I felt like, I, I, I just felt like they, they didn't want me. I felt like they, didn't, they wouldn't miss me if I wasn't there. Then they would even find me at the baseball field in Salinas. Uh, my uncle came and found me. I don't know how he found me, but uh, I had been sitting in the field all night, uh, all during the day during class with my friend, his name was Cowboy. And uh, he was just as wild as me. And so we'd sit in the field most of the day. I don't even think my, my wife even knows or my son knows this story. And I remember going to the baseball field, it was getting dark. And um, I remember they came to get me and uh, I almost didn't want them to find me. And I found later on that that's how I would feel my time is whenever I was bored, I would feel like I probably deserved to be bored. Maybe I deserved to just be by myself. And I was a very lonely kid. And then that's when the substances came in and started to fill in the time instead of being bored. Amen. So um, that's my story of rejection. But you know what? Jesus was rejected for doing good things. Jesus was, amen. Yeah, Jesus was rejected for doing miracles. He was healing the sick, cleansing the lepers. Blind eyes were open. Deaf ears were popped open. The lame walked, and his own people rejected him, and he knew it. He knew he came to an earth where the people were rejected, and yet he still came. And sometimes we need to realize that sometimes we need to go no matter what, whether the people reject us, maybe as a new Christian, that sometimes people aren't going to like that. But they weren't there when you was hurting. They weren't there when you were strung out. They weren't there when you were locked up. They weren't there when you were suicidal. God was there. Jesus was there. Amen. So, of course, they don't understand. They don't understand the loneliness that you had. And then here comes God to the rescue. So here we go again. People are showing up. Now, we got, we're going back to where Jesus was doing his thing out there in, in, out in, in, the, in the world. And now people are showing up. People are talking. And this is how life should be when you're doing what God wants you to do. Because when you're set free, you're starting to do the things that God, is want, God wants you to do. Even being clean and sober for some people is um, something that you would think people are happy about. But sometimes when you go to the barbecue, they ain't so happy about it because you ain't drinking no more. <laughs> oh, you think you're better than us? Oh, you're going to that church now? What are they teaching you? Are they teaching you not to hang out with family? I've heard it all. And I endured. Brother Henry? Yeah, that uh, you're, when you're doing what God wants you to do, and I was thinking about that, and uh, my transition here to at CWC was discipleship. Discipleship through Paragon, discipleship through uh, internship, through Bala classes. And what I discovered was this. When you experience God, right, uh, there's, this, there's this thing that, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. When you experience God, right, it's called G Genos, it's J-G-I-N-O-S-K-O, the strong coordinates. The knowledge that intercepts progress and is a recognition of truth of personal experience. You see, a lot of us don't understand, when, when we experience God, right, it's a personal experience. When I came here, I was coming through the home. I was turned out on drugs. And through that process, I went through discipleship. When I went through the discipleship, I experienced God on another level that changed my life. You see, you see, one thing about God, one thing about God you might not understand is that when you hear the word, it's already working on you. It's already yep. drilling you. Or when you accept Jesus in your life, that's all you got to do is accept it. And then he'll come in, and then that personal experience that you're feeling and what you're going through changes your life. 
He changed your life. You see it in John 8.31. It says that Jesus said to those Jews who believe him and buy in my word, you are my disciple indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You see, Jesus was walking. It didn't matter if they were rejecting him because he knew who his father was. Even his parents had to go look for him. Where are you at? I'm doing my father's business. That's right. That interpretation rocked my world. So now I'm understanding that when I get closer to God, there's people who are going to reject me. You see, when, when you are called, you got to be by yourself. And this is, this, this is what I'm understanding about the rejection. To order to be by yourself, you might have to go through rejection. You see, because you don't know the plan that the Father has for us. That's right. Thank you, Brother Henry. Sister Victoria, can you read the um, next scripture? Mark 3.20. From Mark 3.20, then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And in Mark 3.21, thank you, Sister Victoria. Mark 3.21, it says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. They were embarrassed, it seems like to me. It seems like they were being ridiculed for Jesus doing what he was doing. And you would think this is the place where a person would be getting celebrated because he's already done the miraculous. He's about his father's business. At 12 years old, he told her, I'm about my father's business. When they went to go look for him in the synagogues, he was teaching the teachers. At 12. So you would think there would be a celebration. You would think they would be encouraged. You would think that they would look at the scriptures and know that he is fulfillment of scripture. And that he is the Messiah that they've been talking about for all the generations. The old, the whole Old Testament points to him. And she's already had supernatural encounters with Jesus. And you would think there'd be a celebration and sometimes, and so now by this point, Jesus was rejected by his family, religious leaders, and his hometown. The Bible says a prophet is not without honor except in his own house and in his own town. Sometimes people will have a hard time receiving you as the man or woman of God you are, especially when you're walking in purpose in the gifting and calling of your life. Who are you to have a good job? Who are you to find favor? Who are you to have peace? I've had people call me, is God coming? I've had a family member do that. One I look up to, is God coming to the birthday party? I said, tell him, yeah. <laughs> God's coming because he lives in me. And if you didn't know, hey, yeah, God is coming. So I know how to absorb blows because I've been doing this a while. I tell it like I told you, me with me, don't start and then there won't be none. <laughs> so my thing was, yeah, God is coming because I knew right away I was not offended that he would call me God. You know why? Because I know that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. <laughs> Amen. So we're God carriers. And not only that, he's inside us and outside. The Bible says that he's He's in us, and he covers us. So anything that comes to you, got to go through him first. It got to check with God first. And that's a word for some of you. You thought it came by accident. God said, go ahead and let it come. That's called resistance training. That's how you get big in the spirit. Amen. Jesus was rejected. Okay, right here. Um, Brother Henry, can you read Mark 3, 14 and 15, please? Mark 3, uh, 14 and 15 says, He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might be sent them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. It says he appointed the 12 that they might be with him. So when we look at that scripture, we see that there's a difference. Being with Jesus is different than being around Jesus. Amen. And that's why 
when I shared that about my, my, my family member that was saying, is God coming? I knew he was a person that was around Jesus and wasn't with Jesus. So that was no shame on him. He knew that I'd been going to church. He knew that people were speaking well of me. And they were not at, at one point, nobody spoke well about me. If I was at your house, they'll be like, bro, why'd you let him in? <laughs> Why is he here? Why is the car there? You should have known. I was tricky and slick all the time. <laughs> that's why I spot, that's how I can spot tricky and slick. It takes one and no one. The men's home said, amen. But it's never to embarrass or harass. Or it's always to build up and encourage. Yes. It's never to make him fun of. Because it's not a joke. You're fighting for your life in there. And God is making it possible for you to win the battle. The Bible says the battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Rejection can be a price for following Jesus. Anybody ever been rejected for following Jesus in here? You can raise your hand. Yeah. Haters pop up all the time. But that's all right. Forgive them, Father, for they know that what they do, because they really don't know what they're doing. When they come in against you, they're coming against God. They could come against you any old time. I just posted them on Facebook. There was, um, um, who was it? He fought Mike Tyson. He got his ear bit off. Yeah. He said, you could come against me anytime, but when you, when you come against God, you, are, you got a problem. Amen. And that's the same thing with the believer. You have to have an attitude and not always fight, not always be on defense. Too many Christians are on defense. You can't always be on defense. If anybody knows anything about fighting, professional fighting, once you ball up, they're balling you up. Am I right, Brother Elias? You ball up too long unless there's a strategy to tire them out. But otherwise, you're trapped in the ball. And sometimes we're on defense so much instead of being offensive, instead of coming in with the goodness of God, instead of coming in with the joy of the Lord, but instead of coming in with the light of Christ in us, instead of being joyful. You know, we should be coming in like that. We're, we're the thermostat, not the not, not the. Uh, we're the thermostat. We're not the thermometer. We're not checking temperature. We're making the temperature. We're, we're adjusting temperature. The Bible says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So when you show up to the house and you represent Christ, you're taking a stand. You're lifting them up. Some people will be drawn and some people will flee. The Bible says he is our shield and buckler. He's offense and defense. He got all the bases covered for us. For me, it's always about walk. It's never about talk. Because a person that always talked, like me, I know that that's who I used to be. So I don't talk about stuff first. You'll always catch me doing it first. Amen? Go ahead, Henry. When he was talking, it kind of reminded me, I heard this guy just say the faith-based confidence, right? You're not going to, nobody's going to understand what you're doing. It's one thing to know Jesus, right? But the faith is the only way that you're going to please him. So faith is not just faith in, you know, uh, I have faith. The faith is applying that word and applicating it. Then it, then it becomes differently. And, th and then things start to change because you're out, of, you're out of all control. You place him where he needs to be. Because that's, because I've been going to church for a long time, right? So, oh, I heard a good service. I heard a good service. Going out the other. But at the moment I heard a good service and I applicated that word, my life began to change. No more was I just around with Jesus. I invited him in and I was with Jesus. That's right. So two ways Jesus did not respond to rejection. Number one, Jesus did not, re uh, Jesus did not retreat when he experienced rejection. Sister Victoria? Yeah, Jesus did not retreat when he experienced rejection. You know, a lot of the time when we 
are rejected, we tend to shrink back mm. because of shame. Um, you know, we're ashamed that we're not good enough. We're ashamed that we didn't meet expectations. Um, we're ashamed because we're unwanted. Um, and then when we shrink back, our mind goes into this blame game where we're blaming ourselves. It's my fault because I'm not good enough. It's my fault because I didn't meet expectations. It's my fault because I'm unwanted. And when we shrink back, we tend to shrink back into the darkness because that's instead of moving forward with boldness and charging forward and trying again, we tend to shrink back into the darkness and deal with our shame there because we don't want to be around anyone. We don't want, to, we don't want them to see that shame. Um, but that's, that's not how Jesus reacted when he was rejected, nor is that how he wants us to live when we are rejected. Um, Psalms 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Isaiah 57 says, For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. Um, and I had to look that up because I was like, what does setting my face like a flint actually mean? And it means that you expect that something you are going to do will be hard, but you are determined to be harder. And that's exactly how Jesus was. Um, when you shrink, when you want to shrink back because of rejection, the best thing to do, and I know it's hard because shame is super heavy and it gets to you, especially when you shrink back into the dark place. But the best place or the best thing for you to do when you face rejection and you start to feel that shame is to cry out to God and ask him to replace the shame with his spirit. And with his spirit comes the fruit of the spirit. And the fruit of the spirit is everything you need to make your face like a flint. You know, there's joy, peace, patience, suffering, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And there are many times in the Bible when Jesus was rejected. The ultimate rejection was the cross. And even in the end, he still said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But the many times that Jesus was rejected, he reacted with the fruit of the spirit. He was always calm, and unless he was flipping tables, but they deserve that. <laughs> but he was always calm. He was always loving. His entire ministry was long-suffering. Everything that he did was, was from the fruit of the spirit. And if we ask God to remove our shame and replace it with his spirit, we'll be able to react and not shrink back. We'll be able to react with boldness. Try again. Keep going. God's got me. I can do this. He, he is my strength and my shield. He is my everything. He's got my back. Jesus didn't retreat when he experienced rejection because he knew who he was, but he also knew whose he was. And we are to do the same. Amen. Well done, Sister Victoria. Thank you for that. Um, Brother Henry, you want to read Mark 3.32? A crowd, crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers, he asked. Then he looked to those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mothers and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother and my mother, my brother, and my sister, and my mother. Hmm. Sounds mean, right? But we just read the passage, what she was saying out there, outside. And not only that, the religious leaders were saying, he's demon-possessed, and he's removing, he's, he's getting demons out by the power of the demons. So his church turned on him. His family turned on him. And now he's in this house right now with all these people that he, again, the Bible says, again, he gathered in the home with all these people. And right now he's surrounded with people so much that he don't even have room. He can't even eat in there. So now he's sitting with these same people and they're like, hey, your family's out there looking for you. And then he looks at the circle and he looks at him and he says, who are my mothers and brothers? Right. And it says sometimes, sometimes when rejection leaves us with an empty seat, God can use it as an open seat. God can use it as an open seat. And I want to declare something to you right now. You know what? 
Though my family is not sitting around me, not all of them, there's quite a few of them that are still doing their thing and still figuring out life and seeing uh, how, how life is without God. But I know that there's some open seats. And we, you know what I do is I fill my seats with these guys here. These guys in the men's home, the guys that I talk to on the job, different brothers and sisters that I've run into. I have aunts and cousins and nieces, and I fill those spots in with them to keep the seat warm for them. Are there any open seats in your life right now, and how could you invite others into this space? Sister Victoria? Um, well, in theory, I think that we all have open seats in our lives right now, whether you feel rejected or not. Um, there isn't a life in this congregation that doesn't have room for others. Um, you know, we all need a village, not just to raise our children, but to raise ourselves um, in life, in love, and especially in the Lord. Um, and when I read the verses, I read the commentary notes on the bottom of the page in my Bible, and it says, Jesus does not disown his family. He simply states the truth that spiritual kinship with him goes beyond biological relationships. And that hit me because um, in the body of Christ, like they're just, there's no one in this church that is not my brother, that is not my sister. Amen. And I know that sounds weird and it's awkward, but at the same time, like we were not meant to walk alone. We were not made to be alone. Matthew 3.35 says, For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Sisters, if you need a sister, there are tons of women here. There's Miggy Trevino is the lead of our women's ministry, and she does an outstanding job banning us all together to have a sisterhood. You need a sister, we got you. You need a mother, do you know how many seasoned women there are in this church who would love to mentor you and be a mother for you? Yep. You need a brother? There's a whole house yeah. <laughs> of men who are willing to be your brother. Um, and most of you by now know my story about my brother, but they will, they will they will band together just to be your brother in a heartbeat. And they, that's exactly what they did in my time of need, and I'm so thankful for them. Um, so are there any open seats in your life right now? Yes, there are. And just as Jesus did, look around you. Look around you and invite others into your life. Um, I know it's weird and awkward at first, but to fill that empty seat You've got to take a step of faith and say, hey, will you be my sister? Will you be my brother? I, I really need a mom right now. Children, oh my gosh, when children come to our church and they don't have a mother, man, that just, I literally just want to take them home with me. I'm like, I've got kids. They'll be your brother and sister. <laughs> my husband's back there like, nope. <laughs> But you have to take that step of faith. And sometimes it's a leap of faith because some of us have trust issues. Am I right? But God has a remedy for that. He has a remedy for that. And you have to let, you have to go past that. You have to go past the feeling of that rejection and shame and be like, no, my God's got me and he's placed me in this church for a reason. And I've got brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who want to be there for me. And all it takes is a step of faith. Thank you, sister. Brother Henry. Yeah, uh, that, that when I thought about that rejection, right, for me, the rejection seat, that empty seat, was a seat that was taking a space where God needed to be. So that seat was addiction. That seat was unhealthy relationships. That seat was abuse. That seat was anger. That seat was drug addiction. That seat was depression. That seat was suicide. That seat was abandonment. Then once I understood that this seat was being unoccupied and I was renting space to something, I had to get that off me. That means I had to confide into some brothers that I had some issues. And then I had to be open with the passion, be vulnerable, that there was something going on that needed to come out. 
Because, because when the Bible was telling me, all I got to do is confess my sins and I'll be set free. That wasn't just a super, super sensual, uh, superficial sin. That was a sin that was tucked behind that I thought I forgot. Once I let loose that, then I can allow him to come sit on my seat. You see, this is one thing that I'm understanding about our enemy. He don't mind you coming to church clapping. He don't mind you sitting there sharing the word because he knows the word too. He don't mind you sitting there acting like reciting scriptures. Ooh, he does mind when you take that scripture and you apply that and put it in an empty seat. Every time I feel lonely, every time I feel rejected, right. every time I feel like I want to use, every time I feel like, like I'm being mistreated, every time I felt like I need to go find a healthy relationship, every time I felt like I need to reach out to alcohol, I pulled on to Jesus. You see, that's where we need to be for that empty seat. I've been in ministry strong this time the last six years, and I realized something. Once you understand that that empty seat is being taken up, and you're going home to your moms, your family, and you're arguing with your wife, you're arguing with your kids, and you don't understand, maybe there's something in your seat that don't belong there. That don't belong there. You see, when, when, when Jesus came, he came exposing things. That's why his family didn't like him. Well, wait a minute, I've been religious all my life. I've been religious all my life. You need to come change this. Wait a minute. No. We need a church to take a stand, brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you, Brother Henry. Yep. So I gave them a heads up. I said, you guys, run with what God tells you to run with. Yes. Amen. Are they doing a good job or what? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Catalina. We started. We started that. So Jesus responded to rejection, or how did Jesus respond to rejection? He responded to rejection with an invitation. Jesus had to feel like a doormat, but he rolled out a welcome mat. And looks and sees the people around him and invites him to be part of his family. Jesus experiences rejection, but turns it around to offer an invitation. You see, his own people rejected him, and God's word says that they would reject him. And the Bible says that he said, that's fine. If they rejected me, good for us, bad for them. Because now the Gentiles, the people that are not the Jews, are not the Israelites, are now us. So thank God for the rejection that he felt from his own people, because now we got him, and we ain't letting go. Amen? Amen. Jesus didn't retaliate. He responded with love. Jesus didn't retreat. He refused to give up. Jesus focused on who were there and not who weren't. What are you looking at? Pastor Sefa, would you help us? What are we looking at? You know what? When I sit in the back and I see, and the men, I'm going to use the men's home as an example. I always see everything start with one head in the seat. And before you know it, it's two heads. And before you know it, there's three. And then there's five. And I watch God grow that man's family. I see that man has got a hold of God, and God is now restoring his family. Amen. And he does it in front of everybody to show who he is that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask, think, or imagine. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. And for some of us, we're used to having just enough. But God says, the Bible says that he's the God of more than enough. He's a, he has more than enough love. He has more than enough patience. He has more than enough strength. He has more than enough Amen. Amen. So what are you looking at? You got to ask yourself, what are you looking at? Maybe your family's not there, but I know that you can show some love to your neighbor. The Bible says they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. That's what the word says. He said they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another.
For, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Hebrews 12, 2. Let's stand. Let's stand to your feet. Yeah. Um, I feel like some of you have let rejection become your death sentence mm. or even your resignation. And I just want to speak life to that person because that rejection is not who you are. You know, Jesus died on the cross. That's the ultimate rejection. He was spit upon. His skin was torn apart. He was whipped. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine having that type of rejection? And that what to them, that was his death sentence. But three days later, that man rose from the dead, came back with a vengeance. And in the same way, rejection is not your death sentence, nor is it your resignation. It is an open door for the Lord to use you in many ways that he can't, you may not understand, and you can, it probably cannot be explained, but that's the beauty of our Father is he takes what is broken, the, he takes beauty, he makes beautiful out of ashes. So if you're there, if you're in a death sentence or have you, have you given yourself a death sentence or have you resigned from life, period, because of that rejection. I come against that. I speak against that in the name of Jesus. You are made for more. He has a calling over your life. There is a purpose and a plan specifically for you. And it isn't what you were rejected for. Amen. Thank you, Sister Victoria. So, ministry teams, if you guys could come to the front, we want to pray with you. And I want to ask you right now, you know what? Some of us have been dealing, dealing with rejection. Let me tell you what Jesus did. His ultimate rejection led him to the cross. And he still came back anyway. You need to make a comeback even though you've been rejected. God is showing you that it's possible. The Bible says all things are possible to those who believe. Head bowed, eyes closed. Father, you see all of the, your sons and daughters across this room from every, time of, every type of background, God. And we know that you love them and that they are fearfully and wonderfully made, God. Father, I pray, God, that you would heal that of rejection that they felt, a sense of, no, of worthlessness, Father. Lord, you have stamped value on them, God. Lord, you have made them with value that not, nobody can take away, God. Lord, they may be rejected over here, but the Bible says that you open doors no man can close, and you shut doors no man can open. So, God, I pray, God, that you would touch us in a significant way, God. Lord, be the, our peace that passes understanding. We're humbled by you. We know that you're here. We know that you're touching our lives right now, God. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for those for the places that we were not rejected, God. So I thank you, Father, for this time, this love that you have for us, God. It's amazing love and it's amazing grace, and we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Altars are open, and with that, we want to say thank you for coming out. Remember, love God, love people, and let's change the world. Thank you for being with us tonight. <laughs>